And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Spring Parent Advisory Council meeting for 2021. Thank you so much for uh, making this a part of your day. And um, with all things technology, it's a constant learning curve. So I am uh, learning out in public today. You guys are gonna be uh, part of my learning experience. We got some uh, interesting things going on in our meeting today. We have uh, three presenters. We have uh, myself, uh, we have uh, Dr. Williams, the superintendent, and we have Allison Parker uh, from our special ed department. She'll be uh, making a presentation. And then the technology fun that I have planned after I review uh, the system parent uh, involvement policy, then we're going to go into breakout rooms in which the principals will be able to um, lead your discussions. And uh, I envision that will be 10 to 15 minutes, giving you an update about uh, school level plans and um, seeking your input. And then we will follow that up with a couple of surveys via email uh, at the end of our session. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you guys for joining us. I'm going to advance the slide. This is um, largely what I just said, <laughs> the plan for the meeting. Uh, we're going to have Dr. Williams to give us our system updates, our exceptional student department, Carol Sprague's the director of special ed, and her speaker today is Allison Parker. And then uh, I'll come back and share with you about school improvement and uh, we'll go from there. So without any further ado, Dr. Williams, take it away. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Deckman. Um, in order for us to get started, I just wanted to um, to share a little bit about where we are with our system um, at this point in the year. And as many of you know, we pushed out um, a few weeks ago just about our Finish Strong campaign. And as of right now, we have about 90% of our students who are attending traditionally in our schools, which was a great success. We started the school year off. If you remember, we had a delayed start. So we started after Labor Day. And at that point, we were um, around 68 to 70% of our students um, attending traditionally. So now we're at 90% and we're at the, um, this weekend's the uh, third nine weeks. So we'll start assessing um, who needs to, to come for summer school. And um, we'll, we're planning right now for to have four weeks of summer school to help with the learning loss. And, um, and then before the beginning of the school year, um, some of our elementary schools are planning to have a boot camp to help some of our um, students who still need remediation to um, be able to come in and, and have that so that we are right ready to go when school actually starts for the school year. But um, we are um, planning right now. Um, that's one of the reasons that we had asked for the additional teacher work day so that we could start planning for the four weeks of summer school. Um, the next item on my list is just the additional funding that we are receiving from the um, federal government. Um, and that has to do with um, the elementary and secondary school, secondary school emergency relief funding. Um, so the first um, set that we received was the CARES Act One money. And we had until September, 2021 to spend that. And that was close to a million dollars. Um, and then the second pot of money was um, our CARES Act II money, and that is $4 million. And then now we've received the American Rescue Plan Act, and that's around $9 million. And this is to help with um, learning loss, to help with all the supplies that we've needed to keep our students in school with all the um, COVID necessities, such as the PPE, the masks, the hand sanitizer, all of that equipment that we need. It's also, we can use this money to um, pay for additional staffing that's needed um, for mental health services, for our permanent subs. We are also planning to use it to help um, with our, to upgrade some of our HVAC systems in our schools. Um, we can use this money for security purposes, 
um, and also to help pay for all the summer school and the additional after school and before school that we need. And as you can see, we have for the American Rescue Plan Act, we have until September 23rd, possibly till um, they may extend that. So we'll have until 2024 to um, help use these funds, but this will allow us to help our students for those who need it to, to help get remediated from where we've, um, you know, we're out, we were out um, through previously and back in March of 2020, but also for those who, um, who have experienced remote learning or had to um, be out with due to isolation or uh, quarantining who experienced learning loss. So we are very appreciative of this extra funds that we so desperately need to help recoup with this. Um, and to help supply the additional um, items that we need to help address the issues. And then also in uh, earlier this month, we have applied for the uh, Literacy for Learning, Living and Leading in Georgia grant as L4GA. Um, we should hear back on this grant in uh, hopefully in May at some point. And this is 1.5 million that we've requested. And this will help continue all of the uh, literacy initiatives initiatives that we have in place. It will help with um, screeners that we can continue to assess the students of, of where they are um, throughout the year. Um, and it will also allow us to address, um, to focus on our um, birth to five group as well so that we can get the, our learner, our students at an early age before they even come to our system. And uh, the last thing that I, I have on my list to talk to you this morning about is East Plus Five. And it did pass. And we are so very thankful to all the voters who participated and for all the community support for this. It passed with a 90.27% of the votes. And during the next, um, the years of 2023 through 2027, this will generate 36.8 million dollars for our school system so that we can continue to prepare and plan for the future. Dr. Deckman. And just to share with you a little bit more about what we're planning to do with the East Boss funds. Um, right now we are still currently in our East Boss four. Um, and this was actually approved in 2016 and it'll last until 2000, uh, 2022. Um, and of course the East Boss five was renewed on March 16th, 2021. And like I said before, it goes through 2023 through 2027, and it will help um, keep our local property taxes low um, because everybody helps to support East Boss that comes into our county. Those who come to shop from Tallahassee or Moultrie, they all help pay that one cent sales tax. That is a continuation um, that we've had since it was the first East Boss was put in place in 2003. So this is ongoing sales tax, one cent sales tax. Saturday. Um, what we're proposing to do at hand in hand with um, East Plus Five is to put in new air conditioning, flooring, ceilings, lights, roof and um, paint throughout. We're also planning to put in newer improved classrooms to help to accommodate new programs and enrollment growth, and then also new furniture and playground equipment. And hand, that's, that's okay. Um, with our Garrison Pilcher, we have, we are in the very ending stages of um, finishing modernizing the main building. Um, and that was a $7.5 million project. And we're also wanting to um, do some improvements to the new annex or to the annexes, um, annex one and two. And we're wanting to put new roofs on uh, the annexes as well as air conditioning and uh, new paving and campus improvements throughout. Um, and then also, of course, new furniture and, and playground equipment for the areas that need it. And at Cross Creek, um, we are planning to put new floor, floor covering and paint throughout Cross Creek and then to renovate, um, make renovations there, including the restrooms, and then also to recondition or replace the roof put new windows and doors, um, new paving at Cross Creek, and to add new furniture and playground equipment. As you can see, it was constructed in 1993, and it will be 34 years old by um, the end of the East Boss Five. 
At Thomas County Middle School, it was open in 2005. And for our middle school, we are wanting to put new air conditioning, flooring, ceilings, lights, roof, and paint. We are wanting to repave the driveways and parking lots. Um, and we are wanting to do improvements to our physical education areas and our athletic fields. And also just do some renovations throughout the building. With Thomas County Central High School, um, the main building was constructed in 1990. And I know a lot of people still refer to this as our new high school, <laughs> but, but um, we are wanting to actually put a new building at the high school. We want to put a new multi-purpose building to include classrooms, fine arts, athletics, and our, JRT, our new JROTC program. Um, in addition to the new building, we're wanting to put new flooring, windows, doors, and paint. Um, we're wanting to, um, with the new building, we're going to have to readjust the parking. So we're going to have to reconfigure new parking lots and driveways, and then just in other renovations and modernizations that need to play, take place within um, now through 2027. At the Renaissance Center, which is our alternative school, um, we are wanting to put a new roof for the middle school building and the new HVAC systems for the classrooms and offices, and of course, new paint and floor covering throughout the building. And at Bishop Hall, which is our newest school, it was um, occupied in 2014. Um, it needs um, very little modernization or renovations at this time, but um, we are budgeting for new paint and floor covering, and we um, do house, um, our JROTC program is housed at Bishop Hall and uh, Thomas County Central, so we're wanting to make some modifications to the program at Bishop Hall. And then also, um, we have budgeted any renovations or modifications that would need to take place between now and 2027. And then for the Board of Education campus, we have um, renovated any of the buildings here on the campus, but we still have a few to go. Um, we are planning to renovate the Professional Learning Center, which many of our um, teachers and staff use, but also people from our community use the Professional Learning Center as well, and um, along with the auditorium. Um, so we're wanting to renovate both of those buildings, um, put a new roof on the nutrition building and the warehouse, also renovate the nutrition building and the um, CDL and FCA building and then resurface the parking lots and driveways and um, added a large generator to help support the warehouse freezer and cooler and um, all of our technology infrastructure which is housed on our board of education campus and then for athletics of course we're wanting to um, incorporate with our multi-sports facility at the high school um, but then also we want to do some renovations to um, our athletic um, fields, we're wanting to make improvements to our fields and then um, finish up at the uh, field house and uh, make put a new track on at the football stadium. And with technology, um, we are always needing to upgrade um, our student devices and teacher devices. Um, and then we're also wanting to upgrade all of the smart boards and switch those to the video panels in all of our schools. Um, and then continue to um, upgrade the network structure and um, some of our computer programs, which include accounting management, administrative uh, softwares, and then all of our file servers and printers. And, and those just have to be um, updated on an ongoing basis. And then of course, for instructional, we're wanting to um, continue to upgrade our textbooks and our e-textbooks and the instructional equipment in our um, CTA and science labs. And then also purchase additional band and fine arts instruments and equipment along with our PE equipment. And then we um, always propose um, additional school buses in with our East Blast program because um, we're always trying to keep our buses upgraded on a, a continuous cycle. And then um, to make improvements to our bus garage and put new radio systems in for the buses um, and then update our um, fleet vehicles as they need it. And then for maintenance, we are wanting to um, 
of course, replace the maintenance vehicles as they need it um, also. And then to repave um, you know, driveways and parking lots, as I discussed earlier, and then to replace any of our mowers and our major equipment that we use for our lawn care. And then system-wide, we just want to continue to um, upgrade our security systems, um, including our fire alarms and burglar alarms, um, update any signage that's needed, um, uh, purchase equipment um, energy management systems, including solar panels, um, and then uh, property acquisition as needed to um, plan for student growth. And then for the miscellaneous renovations and modifications, um, to accommodate for student growth and new programs. And I do want to thank you all for your continued support of East Blast. Um, it is truly valuable to our system and we definitely need it. Um, and I want to thank you for all of all the support that you continue to give our school system with all of our new initiatives and programs that we are um, just appreciate so much your support so that we can continue these. Does anybody have any questions for me over the items that I discussed? Dr. Williams, I don't want to put you on the spot, but can you remind us uh, how much does the school bus cost? Uh, it depends on what size. Um, so typically anywhere between 100,000 to 150, somewhere around there, 200. So uh, that's one point of reference for our stakeholders today. Uh, I know that we are very grateful for their support of the uh, East Bloss program, and we project it to bring $50 million of funding to the, uh, the system. That money goes fast. And uh, all these projects uh, are, are pretty uh, costly in order to uh, give our students top-notch education, give them the best facilities and, and buses. And uh, Dr. Williams, I, I wanna speak for everyone saying thank you so much for uh, your leadership, putting this together and, and preparing our system to provide the best uh, facilities for our students. Well, thank you. And we always, um, you know, it's our goal to always be good stewards of the taxpayer's money. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Anyone else have any questions for Dr. Williams? I invite you to unmute yourself. Thank you, Dr. Dakeman. Absolutely. And thank you, everyone. Uh, and we're always available. Uh, if, if you have questions via email or phone, um, and we'll show you the, the website here in just a few minutes where we can be reached uh, if you think of any questions at a later time. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Thank you. All right, uh, just a brief update from me on the strategic planning. So uh, we're so grateful for community support. Uh, every five years, we update our strategic plan for the school system. And uh, that involves a major undertaking to get everybody's input. Uh, we have a five-step process that is um, supported from the Georgia School Board Association. They have a, a model uh, for those meetings, and uh, we invited stakeholder uh, input back in January of 2020. That was pre-pandemic, and it's kind of hard for all of us to remember what, what life used to be like before uh, we had the pandemic and, and COVID took over the place. But uh, anyway, that was in, um, in the spring of 2020. Then we also had the stakeholder survey. Um, we had that meeting at Central where a variety of folks came to give their input in person and then followed up with a survey for those who were unable to attend. Well, then the pandemic happened and uh, the school systems were uh, shut down for a while and then required to uh, provide instruction remotely for the end of the 2020 school year. Um, that postponed our planning uh, process. Well, we're picking that back up again and I'm very excited to be making progress 
So the planning meeting is scheduled for April, uh, the end of next month. And that will be a group of about 40 people. It will have 20 stakeholders and 20 uh, school and system employees uh, to give input on the goals that were indicated in our uh, previous stakeholder meeting. We'll follow that with an action team meeting in May or June that is uh, school system folks that take the plans identified by the uh, stakeholder group and put them into uh, action steps that we can accomplish uh, over the next five years. And we look forward to school board approval. We'll present that sometime this summer and um, we'll make sure that everybody is aware of that process so that you can continue to provide input. And now I would like to invite Ms. Allison Parker to speak to us about our exceptional student program. Good morning, I'm Allison Parker. I work in the exceptional students um, building here at the Board of Education and in all of the schools actually. Our department serves students with disabilities from the three-year-old reverse inclusion classroom at Hand in Hand through the Project Search and Project Life post-secondary program. So we see kids from three to 22, from the time they get here until we get them ready to have a job and, and go into the real world. I work specifically with the area of assistive technology. Um, the special education federal law includes a complex definition of AT, but it's basically any tool that helps a student do something that they wouldn't be able to do otherwise. So I wanna start with an image that always speaks volumes to me. Um, Bob, can you go to the next slide? So this is the difference between equality and equity. Um, in the top picture, you can see that everyone's a little different, but they're all given the same tool to try and use to achieve success. So we look at that and we think, well, that's absurd. They can't all use the same, the same tool. Um, they all clearly have different needs. So now we look at the bottom picture and each person is provided a tool that's based on their unique needs and abilities. So now they have a much better chance of finishing the race and achieving success because they've been given what they need. So the goal of assistive technology is to make sure our students have the right tools to help them to achieve success. Um, this slide is going to show some examples of what areas might be addressed by implementing some sort of technology, assistive technology tool. I do wanna point out that AT encompasses much more than just computer-based options. Some assistive technology solutions require no actual technology at all. So the name is kind of deceiving. As you can see in this graphic, um, it can support many different areas, including research. So that could be just graphic organizers, study skills, aids, um, note-taking. There's a lot of built-in accessibility available on the Chromebooks that we have one-to-one -one in our district that we're very thankful for. And then communication, reading, specific hearing and vision options for students that have visual deficits or who are deaf or hard of hearing. And communication is really my favorite. Um, there's just something about having a student that's nonverbal, that's never been able to talk, putting something in their hands and teaching them how to use it and hearing them speak their thoughts for the first time through a device. We have many different levels of that kind of communication AT in our inventory. And we have students from pre-K all the way to high school using these things. And it's really life-changing for a lot of our students. Um, also, I want to mention real quick that the Georgia Department of Education started an assistive technology initiative this past year. And I'm happy to report that we joined the partnership. And as we joined it, we recognize that our system is ahead of the game in this area. Um, so we hope to continue to strengthen our program and remain a leader in assistive technology for our area and also work cooperatively with the state level 
and be a part of their initiatives and bring more and more assistive technology into our schools. Thank you, Ms. Parker. Um, I have a question for you and I, I'll invite the audience to ask a question uh, also if they have uh, an interest. Uh, Ms. Parker, can you share with us, um, I know that you're <laughs> sitting on the edge of your seat. What are you <laughs> wondering what I'm gonna ask? <laughs> Tell us more about the visual supports, the vision supports that we offer. A lot of times we, we think of uh, eyeglasses and that sort of thing. Can you tell us how many different things we do for the visual support? Sure, so actually I'm also the teacher for the visually impaired for our school system. So I got um, certified as a TVI a couple of years ago. And so I serve all the students in our system that have visual impairments. And so we have things like touch screen Chromebooks that have a larger screen that they can enlarge to make sure that they're able to access their classroom material. We also have um, some low tech things like um, magnifiers, monoculars. They really enjoy using those in the classroom, to be honest, because they look like a pirate or something. They like using those. Um, and we also have a piece of equipment that um, you can take your textbook and it magnifies it up onto like a TV screen. And so they can take any, any kind of printed material, magnify it so that they can um, manipulate it on a screen. So that's a really neat, that's a really neat thing that we have. And I think that if we, we took time to ask about each circle, there are so many different levels of support uh, that we provide for our students. And, and we just thank Ms. Parker for the work that she does with all of our students uh, supporting their needs and uh, the whole special ed department as well. Uh, they well, are- I do um, wanna to mention too, Dr. Dickman, that you know, a lot of these supports are available, not just for students with documented disabilities. So even our general education students, and um, they, they have access to a lot of these things because maybe they do have deficits that aren't significant enough to require them to need um, specialized instruction, but they, they do need a little support. So this is not just a special ed kind of thing. We do work with students all on the um, continuum of services. That's a great clarification. Thank you so much. Anyone else have any questions for Ms. Parker? Well, again, uh, she's available on our web. If you uh, have any questions, you can, you're invited to send her an email or-, or That's right. And I even up. have an assistive technology website on linked on our Thomas County Schools website under the Exceptional Students Department. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, returning to our meeting. Uh, the next uh, phase of our conversation is to talk about the uh, required documentation to implement the Title I program for our school system. And um, you'll see some bulleted points here. These five documents together uh, represent all the planning and uh, needs assessment, obviously, for us to implement an instructional program every year. Okay, it begins with a comprehensive needs assessment in the spring. Um, we look at student performance, we look at attendance and discipline, we look at uh, professional learning needs and all, all the areas that we um, see about to run a high performing school district. Um, at the conclusion of the needs assessment, we begin to make plans to improve um, our results and we identify actions uh, we identify stakeholders that can help with that action, uh, resources needed to support our students. <clears throat> and then you'll see these last three bullets here, family engagement, family engagement, school and parent compact. Those documents uh, strengthen the link between our families and our community and our school system because this is a true partnership uh, together. <clears throat> And so uh, <clears throat> this is my one slide with animation. So let's see if this works. Uh, 
If you were interested in finding uh, plans to review uh, at a later date, you'd certainly uh, be able to find them on our Thomas County Schools webpage, www.thomask12gaus. That's a screenshot of the top of the page there. And then from there, uh, you would hover over departments, slide down the middle of the drop down menu to federal programs. If you click that um, link there, it will have a pop out menu for federal programs information. That takes you to another page, the federal programs page. And uh, along the right hand side of the screen, you'll see that we have posted our documents. And the one I'd like to talk about with you today is the system family engagement policy. So um, every year, the Department of Education requires us to identify certain elements of ways that we're going to partner with families in the community to support our students academically. And um, the next several slides is, are going to break that down and uh, present what's in the plan now uh, that you can see online. They won't exactly have the highlights that I have, uh, but you'll be able to see that verbiage. And then uh, you'll be able to give your input on some improvements. The first requirement is that the plan is jointly developed. So that's the purpose of our meeting today is to not only present the plan, but ask for your inputs. Um, we gather input through the planning process, review and improvement of our programs. We hold building level meetings as well as this uh, system parent advisory council meeting. Um, Technical assistance, it's my responsibility uh, as the federal programs director to support our system and our school with uh, designing these plans and keeping them up to date so that we can maximize family engagement so that our families know how to support their most valued commodity, their children. You want everybody's uh, student to be fully supported. So this is a screenshot of uh, one of the survey questions that I'm going to present. And if you'll allow me just to spend a little bit of time on this slide, uh, you know, if we were meeting face to face, we'd have a paper copy of the survey on the table and I would, you know, tell you some things that we do uh, every year to involve families in our meetings and updating our plans. And then I'd ask for you to mark that answer on your sheet and give us suggestions on ways to improve. Well, because it's virtual, um, we can't really, not everybody has a split screen function on their computer. So uh, you're, you're watching the screen, but it'll be difficult to do the survey at the same time. So I've designed a survey that I will email you a link at the end of our session, and it's gonna have this page. And almost every question, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what we're doing so that you have a frame of reference to answer the next question. So example here, uh, the ways that we involve parents in planning and implementing our family engagement program include this parent meeting, school council meetings, uh, focus groups at the school level, school volunteers, which has been interesting this year in the pandemic. We haven't really had very many volunteers, uh, opportunities anyway. And then uh, participation in school events like open house, we did do open houses and uh, student reward activities. Um, so then I'll go on to present the question. And then if you have any suggestions that you'll be able to make those suggestions. So um, the third element of the requirements of this plan include an annual evaluation. We have to look at our plan. We can't put it on the shelf and say, we've been there and done that, moving on to our day-to-day uh, -day work. We have to come back to it every year to see how we've done. And um, we do that in our meeting today, as well as in focus groups at the school levels. Um, 
And one of the requirements is to identify barriers. You see about the third line down, it says identifying barriers to uh, family engagement. And uh, so we want you to help us think about that in a way that we could help folks overcome those barriers to plug into our schools and school system. So of course, membership on committees and uh, completing surveys, attendance at special meetings, those are ways that we involve our families. And, and I'll ask if you think that we have a good way to involve our families and if you have suggestions to improve that. And again, about the removing barriers, question three talks about uh, things that might prevent folks from attending a meeting. Uh, transportation, well, if the meeting's on Zoom, we've perhaps we've removed that barrier. Uh, child care, communication, time of events, any other things that you'd like us to think about so that we can increase the number of folks that are involved in our schools. The next requirement of the plan, um, and before I continue on to this slide, let me say, it may seem like I'm, I'm rushing. I am excited to talk to you about these plans. But uh, again, every picture, every uh, slide is gonna tell you a little bit about what we're doing. So it's not like you have to memorize what I'm saying right now. You'll be able to reflect on uh, the plan by going to the website or the uh, prompt right before the question. Reservation of funds is a requirement uh, for school systems that receive more than $500,000 of federal aid. Uh, this year, Title I program gave the, uh, the school system $1.3 million. And um, therefore, we have to have a reservation of funds. We have to set aside uh, part of that funding to implement family engagement activities. Now, they require 1% reservation. Uh, that's that second line, 1%. And we ask, we're required to ask your input on how we spend that 1%. Uh, quick math. 1% is about $13,000. So that, uh, that didn't go very far. What we do with our um, set aside <coughs> is uh, some of the things that are highlighted here below. We have a parent and family engagement coordinator at each of our Title I schools. We provide professional learning, not only for our school personnel, but for uh, families, supporting programs, information on best practices so that if you come to the school and say, my student is struggling, do you have any suggestions? Then we'll have some uh, resources that you may be able to use with your student. And then collaborating with community organizations uh, so that we can maximize the benefits for our students. So uh, I told you a moment ago that we get $1.3 million for Title I programming in our district. Um, we're required to set aside 1%, that's $13,000. Well, this year we set aside 16.8%. Uh, that's the commitment, the level of commitment we have for our family engagement program that provides salaries and supplements for our parent coordinators, uh, some funding, that allow them to have programming for parents, uh, professional learning, educational materials, and communication about our events. And uh, we invite you to think about other ways that we might be able to uh, involve families. Coordination of services. Uh, this is uh, the requirement that we blend our grant programs to maximize the support for our students. So you have a long list here uh, in this top paragraph, Title I, uh, the migrant program is a Title I C program, Title III, English uh, speakers of other languages, the ESOL program, Title VI, Title IX for homelessness, uh, and our preschool program, all of those programs have similar uh, aims, and that is to support the academic achievement of all of our students. 
Um, so it takes uh, coordination, coordinated effort. And uh, Dr. Williams has assembled a team here at the district office, as well as folks at uh, the schools that work together, engaging community stakeholders and partners to make sure that our kids have the very best uh, services, the best facilities, and that we're working together for, with a common goal. And so we invite you, we will invite you to give us suggestions about improving that coordination, especially if you know of a, a group that you wanna make sure that we're uh, working with, um, please think about that. The next requirement is uh, to build capacity. So the first element is building capacity of school staff. And we're required every year to seek family input on things that we need to tell our teachers to work on to improve communication with uh, home, between home and school. And uh, we do that uh, every semester. Our parent coordinators provide that information to our staff. Uh, we have electronic uh, training sessions as well as in-person meetings to remind folks that uh, you know it's important to communicate what's going on in the classroom so that families are well informed. I'll tell you, if you mentioned to me that uh, my son needs to study on his vocabulary words and do better, I'm gonna ask him about it. But if, if I wasn't aware he was struggling, then that might not be asked. So engaging a family can be something as easy as keeping them up to date on student performance in the classroom. So uh, we ask your input on things that we need to provide annual training for our staff, just uh, reminders, and, and they may be based on your own experiences uh, with the schools, and we wanna know that. The other requirement in the plan is to provide uh, building capacity events for parents. And the uh, federal law says that we've got to talk about five things. We've got to tell everybody the challenging state academic standards. And then we have to talk about assessments. So for example, the milestone tests are uh, coming up this May and we need to uh, make sure that our students are well prepared that our families are well prepared to uh, talk with their students about that upcoming assessment. We, we need to talk about the requirements of Title I. Uh, there are rules that come along with grant funding. And so we wanna make sure you're well informed of those uh, processes as well. We need to uh, train parents on how to monitor their children's uh, progress. There are a lot of different ways that our, our system communicates about uh, student performance. Uh, one of them is parent portal. Uh, everybody can see the teacher grade book and uh, they have the ability to know uh, if their student is marked absent or tardy, but also uh, how they're doing on their assignments. And that's a, a really great way to keep uh, tabs on your student performance. But also we talk about things such as Remind 101, which is a messaging system. I think uh, we've used this for several years. A lot of people are, are well-versed in that. Our system websites, newsletters, uh, emails, uh, all of those are different ways to communicate with families. <clears throat> and so the building capacity element asks you to think about are there certain workshops or topics that you want us to tell you more about? Um, and so that's uh, the next two questions here. We'll ask you, uh, are there any things that you'd like for us to present to you on how to advocate for your child's education? Um, some folks may have difficulty articulating the question they wanna ask. They just know, gosh, my, my youngster is struggling. Uh, how can we help? Uh, so that may be something you consider there. But also, if there are any activities you'd like the district to offer um, so that we can promote family engagement. The 
The next slide has a couple of more questions and that will take us to the end of that survey, uh, asking you to say if you would like more information about following topics, uh, if you have any questions about those sorts of things, or if you think that'd be a good uh, idea to share with others, then uh, please do indicate that. Uh, there's, I believe there's a question not presented uh, about, excuse me, um, whether or not you think it'd be useful to have a monthly parent newsletter. Um, there's a couple of products out on the market that might be able to give tips and suggestions to families about how to engage with their school, how to support their children academically. And so we invite your input on that. All right, now it's time for the technology challenge. So I'm going to ask your um, indulgence here. Uh, it may take us a minute to assign you to the rooms. I, I tried to enroll this ahead of time, and you may already be assigned in a room, or we may have to drag and drop your name into the room. Uh, so once you are invited to a breakout room, I'd like for you to please join that room. The host will be your school's principal and they'll talk to you about the school improvement plan. You'll have about 10 to 15 minutes for a discussion about how things are going at the school and what their academic goals have been this year and progress they've made. <clears throat> There'll be a survey at the end of that as well, uh, also sent to you via email. So uh, it's your lucky day. You're gonna get two surveys for the price of one. I know that's exciting to me. <clears throat> All right. And so if you happen to see a uh, invitation to join a, screen, uh, join a room, you can certainly do so at this time. Okay, everybody, I think that uh, most folks are rejoining the main room. And uh, I just want to say a big old thank you to everybody uh, for participating today. I know that uh, you're, you've got a busy schedule and uh, we, we are grateful for the opportunity to meet with you, tell you how things are going and ask for your input. Um, <clears throat> please uh, be on the lookout for a couple of surveys that I'll send later today uh, for you to give input. And if you would like, I would invite you to uh, respond to that email saying whether or not uh, you found the uh, Zoom meeting and the breakout rooms helpful or um, whatever else you may want to give me some feedback on. But uh, I do want to say thank you again for everything. And please let us know if uh, we can help you in any way. I hope you all have a great day. Bye-bye.